Hello there. It's November 2020. What a month it's been so far. But here we are. We made it to the Linnaean Society of New York's third online speaker meeting. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ken Chea. I'm the president of the Linnaean Society of New York, and I wish to call this meeting to order. I'm delighted to be here tonight to welcome our members, our friends, and guests to the November speaker meeting. This meeting doesn't happen simply because we would like it to. It doesn't happen by hoping and wishing. This meeting happens because a number of people come together and work to make it happen. So I'd like to give a very quick shout out to my team of fellow officers, council and committee members, and past presidents, whose time and effort continues to keep us moving forward this year, despite the many challenges of COVID-19. Without their hard work and support, we would not be streaming live right now or welcoming new members each month or reaching you on social media or sponsoring Linnaean field trips, which are in full swing right now due to their, and due to their popularity have been extended in Central Park during the month of November. I was out there this morning, in fact, with one of three Linnaean groups, and the park was crackling with autumn color. We saw a host of beautiful seasonal birds. Uh, a crow chased a juvenile red-shouldered hawk right above our heads. There were chickadees, tufted titmice, juncos, a woodcock, and the reservoir is getting really busy with winter waterfowl right now. It was great. So for more information about our programs or to register for one of our upcoming field trips, please go to our website at LinnaeanNewYork.org. That's LinnaeanNewYork.org. I'll give, a, give it a shot at spelling it for you. L-I-N-N-A-E-A-N-N-E-W-Y-O-R-K.org. Now, sadly, I must re report tonight the recent loss of the society's oldest member, Michael Burke Flynn of El Paso, Texas, who passed away at home on October 26, 2020. Michael was 100 years old. He joined the society in 1937, 83 years ago. His daughter, Bonnie, tells us that each year, Michael insisted on renewing his membership in the society. On behalf of the Linnaean Society of New York, we wish to extend our sincerest condolences to the entire Flynn family and to the friends of Michael Burke Flynn. Now, as many of you already know, the American Museum of Natural History has canceled all program events through November of this year, and we have not heard any further news from the museum as to when we may expect to return to the Linder Theater. The good news, however, is that until we are able to return uh, and resume our meetings there, we plan to continue to bring our, you our monthly speaker meetings right here online via Zoom. For tonight's program, we have disabled the Zoom chat feature, as well as the video and the microphone. So you don't have to worry about your evening wardrobe, or if your apartment is messy, or if the dog is barking, or if your parrot is using foul language again. Sit back, relax, and enjoy tonight's program. One feature we haven't disabled is Zoom's Q&A feature. During tonight's program, you may use that feature at the bottom of your screen to send us a question for the speaker. Following the speaker's presentation, our Vice President, Rochelle Thomas, will take some time to select a few of your questions. At last month's meeting, using the Zoom polling feature, you had the opportunity to let us know by voting if you would like to see more than one Zoom speaker meeting per month. Tonight, I'm pleased to announce that the members have spoken and the results are in. When asked if you would like to possibly see two speaker meetings a month versus just one, the results were 92 yeses and 39 noes. 
the yeses have it. There's no need for a recount, and we found no evidence of fraudulent polling behavior. We at the Society are very pleased to know that these meetings have struck a popular note with many of you. Now, it remains to be seen if we will be able to actually pull it off. As I said earlier, putting these programs together takes an extraordinary amount of time and energy. And it is important to note here that this, the society is run entirely by volunteers. So while we will be looking into the possibility, if we can find a way to make it work, it will not be happening until 2021. We will keep you updated of any changes, of course, and once again, we thank you for sharing your opinion with us. Because we now have the opportunity to vote by email, and thank you members for returning your votes, I have three business items to present this evening. In my last president's letter, I asked the membership to vote on three items. One, to accept a number of new applicants for membership, and two, to accept the past two months of general meeting minutes. Once again, our members have spoken, and with 79 votes of approval and zero votes of opposition, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the following 11 applicants as new members of the Linnaean Society of New York. Beatrice Schwartz, sponsored by Miriam Rakowski. Jean-Paul Picard, sponsored by Mary Picard. Donna L. Schulman, sponsored by Mary Normandia. Gillian Henry, sponsored by Victoria Seabrook. Sally Kopstein, sponsored by Nancy Shambam. Mary Ann Zovko, sponsored by Kevin Sisko and Kathleen Heenan. I. C. Levenberg Engel, sponsored by Gabriel Willow and Ruth Hart. Lenge Hong, sponsored by Gabriel Willow. Michelle Chuong, sponsored by Crystal uh, Thiel. And Sylvia Paredes, sponsored by Chuck McAlexander. If any of you are out there watching right now, imagine you are hearing a thunderous applause bouncing off of the ceiling and rolling through the aisles of the Linder Theater. Congratulations all and welcome to the Linnaean Society of New York. And by the way, if any of you out there are wondering about becoming a member, we would love to hear from you. Just go to our website, LinnaeanNewYork.org, and you will find all the information that you need. And just in case you need a sponsor and you don't know many members yet, I will be happy to sponsor you. You can contact me about sponsorship or any of the other officers of the society. It doesn't have to be me. There's Rochelle, there's Ruth, Lydia, Jonathan. These are all very nice people. So I'm not your only choice here. And I won't take it personally, although maybe I will. Anyway, go to the bottom of our website homepage, click on contacts, and there you will find the email addresses of the officers that I just mentioned. And you could contact any one of us for more information. And please remember, any society or organization is only as healthy as its growing and diverse membership. We would love to hear from you and to welcome you to our growing community. In addition to motion one, motions two and three to accept our September and October general meeting minutes also passed by a vote of 79 to zero. Our final item of business this evening is to nominate a can candidate for our council. When council member Amy Simmons recently accepted the position of recording secretary, and thank you, Amy, this left a vacancy in the council. So I would now like to officially ask for nominations from the floor. Since this is a meeting taking place online, you may send me any names for nominations that you have via email at president 
at LinnaeanNewYork.org. Nominations will be accepted only until 9 o'clock this evening. So once again, if you would like to propose a candidate for Linnaean Society of New York Council, please be sure to email me at president at LinnaeanNewYork.org this evening before 9 p.m. That email address can also be found on our website homepage under contacts. And now, at last, it is my pleasure to announce this evening's speaker. The brown rat, Rattus norvegicus, has invaded our cities and islands across the globe, caused major public health risks and conservation concern. Yet, despite their close association with humans, we know strikingly little about the ecology and behavior of rats. Useful management strategies for rats require biological context, including an understanding of how they disperse through the environment, how landscape variation influences populations, and how rats across different cities exhibit parallel or divergent outcomes. A combination of genetic approaches, modeling tools, and common sense are used to examine urban rats and their impact on humans and wildlife. Examples from New York City as well as other cities around the world show how science can improve our understanding of and policy surrounding this pervasive pest species. Matthew Combs earned his PhD at Fordham University in Bronx, New York, studying the ecology and evolution of brown rats in urban landscapes. His work leverages genetic and modeling tools to understand rat migration dynamics and their influence on zoonotic diseases. Matt has worked with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Health Hygiene excuse me, on the rat control efforts and promotes the inclusion of biological context in management strategies. He currently works as a postdoctoral research scientist at Columbia University studying the evolutionary and ecological drivers of Lyme disease. Ladies and gentlemen, Matthew Combs. All right, thank you so much, Ken. Let's see what get started here. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, I've been to several Linnaean Society talks and really enjoyed all of them. Uh, so I'm honored to be able to present today um, and give all of us a little bit of a distraction from the craziness of our world. We can think a little bit more about the world of rats today. So much of this was just covered, but just for an introduction, hi everybody. Um, I essentially study rodents uh, in New York and in other ecosystems uh, to try and understand ecological and evolutionary drivers um, of, yes, their diseases, but also the way they inhabit cities um, and use the, the resources that we as humans provide. And I really uh, try to not just stay in my academic bubble, but try and promote the science uh, in terms of management strategies for folks out there who are on the front lines battling the, these rats and rodents, um, and also for the public, uh, because I know there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about rats, and hopefully today we'll, we'll dispel a few of those. So we're talking about rats, but we can't talk about rats without talking about cities and the process of urbanization that creates them. So here we're showing the island of Manhattan as it was on the left pre-colonization, um, and this is a reconstruction of the expected ecology uh, and topography of Manhattan as it was in 1609, done by Eric Sanderson, who's here in New York at the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, it's got a great book all about this if you're interested. But on the right, you can see the 
the extreme transformation of the landscape as we see it today. Um, and we can think about the ecological changes that are associated with urbanization here. Uh, that includes the conversion of green spaces on the left to these built up gray spaces of buildings and roads that we occupy. The native resources, those flora and fauna and food uh, are replaced with anthropogenic resources, often in quite high abundances for the species that are able to, to go and get them. And the patch size has decreased dramatically. So that is talking about the area on the left, you can see big contiguous patches of forest and marsh. Whereas on the right, we can see that the landscape is broken into thousands of individual properties and parks, uh, each with their own ecological conditions. So we can think about how the ecology of cities, and I, I do think about cities as a unique ecosystem. So, you know, you could think about a desert or a montane forest. Temperate cities like ours have their own conditions uh, and their own pressures that animals respond to. So when it comes to mammals, some mammals, say the beaver, for instance, don't do very well in cities. They need lots of space. Uh, water in this case and, and forest to, to build their habitat. Other species uh, like the white-footed mouse are quite flexible and they're found both in the, the countryside on the left as well as in cities in the parks and remnant green spaces. And then there's the urban specialists like brown rats uh, and those tend to uh, exploit the resources and the conditions of cities and they're found not only in the parks and green space, but also the gray space of cities, the buildings, um, the below ground infrastructure, of course, and they're really able to dominate these cities. And so these are the, the species that I'm really interested in because by understanding their biology, we can start to learn a little bit more about the ecology of cities uh, and the way that it creates habitat or, or different dynamics for the animals that inhabit. Of course, cities are all over the world. We can see here just a simple map of cities and their relative size. And you can think about each one of these dots containing its own unique rat population. And that's, that's pretty true. Almost every single one of these cities has either a brown or black rat population. And so that provides an opportunity to study uh, rats across different cities. Um, here today, I'm gonna focus mostly on New York City uh, but during my PhD, I spent a lot of time comparing uh, the results of different populations. So let's get to know our friend, the brown rat, a little bit better here. Ratus norvegicus, often called the Norway rat, but not necessarily from Norway. So we call it the brown rat. I like to describe these as opportunistic generalists. I think that's exemplified by pizza rat here. Basically, it means that they will eat whatever they can find and they'll live wherever they can create a burrow, whether that's you know, a nice earthen burrow in the park, the sort of quintessential rat habitat in the city, or whether it's you know, in your basement or in your cupboard if you let them. Um, rats are really flexible and able to live um, just about anywhere that they can create a little nest and find a little bit of food. Rats have rapid reproduction uh, a single mother rat gives birth to about 10 to 12 pups when she's healthy. The gestation period lasts only 21 days, three weeks, and immediately following giving birth, these rats can reproduce again. Um, but not only do they have a fast reproduction rate, they also die off quite quickly. Most rats in New York City won't live more than a year. So they've got these boom and bust cycles, meaning that their populations can track the available resources and they can respond quite rapidly uh, to say a new garbage pile or um, you know uh, the restaurant that leaves out it, its food every night. Rats are quite intelligent and also very social in their behavior. They learn from one another. In this uh, camera photo we took under some some public housing in New York you can see these rats sort of communicating whether it's through vocal vocalizations or through scent. Um, they're able to learn about new food sources and also new dangers, right? They can understand when one rat dies, maybe they want to avoid that area. And so they can 
change their behavior to fit the environment they're in at the moment. Lastly, rats are simply amazing physical specimens in their ability to navigate the city. Um, they, they're excellent climbers and swimmers. Um, they're quite quick and they can gnaw through asphalt. In this case, you can see this rat has uh, dug a burrow right through the sidewalk. It's just a few feet away from a dumpster there on the right, but they can gnaw through things like aluminum or cement uh, that other animals simply can't get past. Rats just chew their way right through. So in that way, they're able to access the city in a way that, that many other animals can't do. Now, as New Yorkers or, or folks familiar with rats, I'm sure you've seen some of these wild and, and almost apocryphal stories of rats. Uh, and I wanna spend just a minute talking about some of the myths and, and the facts about rats. And I'm sure there'll probably be uh, some other questions about things you've heard and we can talk about some other myths. Uh, the biggest one out there, I think, biggest is that rats are as big as cats, right? Or as big as my small dog. And I saw it with my own eyes, it was three feet long. Um, that's really not true. You're never gonna find a rat that's as big as a full grown cat. For the most part, their weight maxes out at about a pound and a half. Uh, there's never been a rat found more than two pounds of this species. Um, and so if you, if you find one that you think is bigger, please let me know. There's a standing bet with one of my colleagues for $500, anyone who shows up with a rat bigger than two pounds. Um, in this photo here, you can see some of a, a size distribution on the right, some juveniles and moving to the left, uh, these, these adults. The one on the left is the biggest rat that I've ever caught. It was about a pound and three quarters and it's now deposited in the Yale Peabody Museum. If you're ever interested in, in fact checking me, um, it's up there for posterity. Next myth is that in New York, there's one rat for every human, right? The expectation of eight or nine million rats on the streets. And by our best estimate, that's far from true. Um, estimates range from a few hundred thousand to a couple million. Um, but the important point I want to bring up is that the rat population is never just one number at all times. It fluctuates through the year. Um, in the winter, when it's cold and reproduction goes down and mortality goes up, the population dives down. And in the spring and summer, it starts to come back up. And you can see that here in this plot of the uh, rodent complaints uh, in New York City. Um, you might notice past about 2014, 2015, the numbers start to go up. And we attribute that to a change in the way that complaints are made. They introduced a texting system. Instead of calling on the phone, you could just text in a complaint. So uh, complaint numbers actually went up when that started. Another myth I hear a lot is that rats can sort of flatten themselves down into a pancake and squeeze under any crack or crevice, no matter how small. And while rats are able to um, sort of flatten their ribs, which are hinged to a small degree, uh, they have skeletons, they have bones, just like uh, other mammals, and they're really limited by the size of their skull, which I've shown here. Uh, good rule of thumb is about the size of a quarter is, is, is generally the limit to a full-grown rat, um, if you're thinking about that hole under your cupboard and whether it's, it's big enough for a rat to, to show up through. Um, so they are able to squeeze themselves through small, small areas, but they are limited uh, by physical constraints, just like all other animals. The last myth I want to address, uh, I think might touch uh, on some people here that might be interested in this, that, that cats might be able to reduce rat populations, right? Cats are a predator, rats are the prey, maybe it makes sense. But in the few studies that are out there, there's really no evidence that cats um, can do any lasting damage to, to a, a full-fledged rat population. So there was a study in Baltimore showing that, yes, cats pick off a few rats, maybe the young ones, maybe the weak ones, but overall the populations don't change in the presence of cats. Um, and in New York, very recently, Michael Parsons uh, showed that Rats will simply just change their behavior in the presence of cats, trying to avoid them, uh, but generally their survival isn't really affected by cats. The only time I think they might be useful is perhaps to deter a new invasion of, of rats from coming in. 
um, when they're just starting to invade. But generally, if you have a population of, of rats, the cats are really not going to do much except for kill the birds and other <laughs> animals that are out there. So if you have a cat, please keep it inside. It's not doing anything for the rats. All right. So if those things are not true about rats, why do we care about them? What is there to worry about? The most important thing is public health. Uh, rats carry a number of viral uh, agents and bacterial uh, species that can really cause uh, serious illness in humans, even mortality. Leptospirosis down there at the bottom uh, kills about 60,000 people a year worldwide. Not too many in, in New York, but there have been recent fatalities. Uh, dogs often pick up leptospirosis. Um, there are a number of things we really don't want to catch from rats. Um, that includes this group of ectoparasites, right? The mites and lice and fleas that are on the outside, which can pick up those pathogens and then transmit them to humans if they come into contact. So there have been studies, uh, I've listed a few at the bottom here that have shown all of these agents and more in New York City. Um, so this is a reason why we want to keep rats out of the places we live, the places we eat, because they can really, uh, really cause some damage if they get out of control. Number two is that rats are really a menace to infrastructure. I mentioned that they're able to gnaw through concrete and wood and other things. You'll see sidewalks cracked and foundations tilted from the activity of rats. On the right here, I'm showing a picture that was recently in the news where a man simply fell through the sidewalk into what was described as a sinkhole. Uh, and in the bottom, he found out there were a lot of rats down there. Um, so this sort of took over the tabloids. But what likely happened was there's some sort of uh, unpermitted basement down there uh, with, with weak supports. You can see a little bit of perhaps wood support sticking out of this hole. And what likely happened was rats got in there caved in some certain supports and, and created the opportunity for this cave-in to happen. Um, so we know that they can cause a lot of damage to the physical infrastructure of cities. The third thing is that rats can really do a lot of damage to the other animals in, uh, in an environment by spreading poison um, when they themselves eat the poison and then are then eaten by animals further up the food chain. Those Predators can then become poisoned um, and often succumb. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, um, but in terms of the ecology of cities, this is a really important one to think about. Uh, and it doesn't just happen in, in cities. It happens anywhere you've got rats and poison together. So what can science do to help, right? What, what has my research done that's made any sort of impact on this at all? Um, and I want to point out that there's a lot we don't know about the basic biology of, of these animals. And yes, they are one of the most important model systems for developing new medicines. Um, lots of biological research relies on rats, and we know a whole lot about them in those contexts. But in terms of their wild behavior, uh, their wild interactions in places like cities, there's really a lot we don't know. So today I want to talk about three different aspects of rat biology. First, we're going to talk about rat distribution. Where are the rats in cities and why are they there? Um, so we'll try and correlate their abundance with different ecological conditions. Second is to look at the overall population connectivity, right? You can't get rid of a rat population um, if you don't understand how it works and the dynamics of, of both the, the boom and bust cycles as well as the movement of rats between different colonies and around the city. And then third, we're going to talk about some new work um, that just recently has been published uh, by some collaborators with me, looking at adaptations of rats uh, to new pressures that the cities create. So how have rats actually been evolving uh, in response to cities and the rodenticides we use? So when we think about rats in the city, where we might find them, it's easy to sort of take a look at this map and think about, oh, I know Central Park, oh, I know the Upper East Side. But when I look at it, I see different types of ecological variation. There's natural variation in the green spaces. There's social variation in the, the way people organize themselves and the, the activities they do. 
and there's a lot of variation in the built environment, what the city is actually created um, out of, what, and what the rats use as substrate. So we tested a few different uh, landscape variables here. I'm gonna just talk about a few. Uh, we looked at the amount of green space in a city. And here we're just talking about Manhattan. You can see Central Park there in the middle, uh, Riverside Park on, on the west side, and different areas where there are more or less green space. And the social aspect, we look at things like median income. Of course, New York City has really striking uh, economic inequality, you know, huge changes in those sorts of conditions over just a few blocks. And that can, of course, have downstream effects on the types of environments in those areas. Uh, this picture here is showing a garbage pile that was left to languish for weeks um, in, a, in a poorer area of the city, something that likely wouldn't happen uh, in an area with, with a little bit more um, political sway. And then we can look at things like uh, the abundance of brick sewers, right? And for those who don't know, the sewers in our city are actually of two different types. There are the old brick line sewers, which are much more easy for rats to uh, inhabit. And then there's the newer cast concrete sewers, which are uh, much less habitable by rats. And so we looked here in this case at just the, the density of brick sewers in the city. Uh, and there's a list of, of some other variables we used as well. So what did we do? We used a program called Maxent to correlate those, those variables with the presence of rats in New York City. Now on the left, what I'm showing you is a single red dot for each place that the Department of Health identified rat activity. They actually did a full sweep of Manhattan in 2012, checking every building and property lot in the city or in Manhattan to look for the presence of rats. And on the right, what I'm showing you is the output of that, of that study, um, where those yellow areas are predicted to have higher rat abundance and the lower areas, uh, the, those sort of darker colors have, have lower abundance. And so there's a couple of striking things we can see. Um, some neighborhoods like the Lower East Side, uh, much of Harlem and Inwood appear to be quite, uh, quite good rat habitat with uh, predicted large amounts of rats. Other areas, not so much. You can see Midtown Manhattan has um, some pretty dark areas. You might be focusing on Central Park, which here uh, doesn't have, uh, we're, we're looking, it doesn't appear to be very rat friendly. And that is in part because there aren't any buildings in, uh, in Central Park to, uh, to inspect. So there's a little bit of a bias there. But what, if you look closely, you can see that the edges of Central Park actually appear to be um, higher suitability for rats than the interior of, of the park. And we think that holds true. Uh, you tend to find fewer rats in the center of the park. And when you do, they're at lower densities than you would find in, say, um, the Upper West Side just next door, where we know, you know, blocks can, uh, can support much larger numbers of rats in the same small area. So, I want to dig into this a little bit more Oops. Back. and talk about what went into this model. So what were the most important predictors? Uh, turns out that the age of the building was actually the most important thing to predicting rats in this model. And we can look at that, what that looks like. Here I'm showing you, uh, moving from left to right, the age of the building. So starting at the earliest, 1750 into the 2000s. And on the y-axis, moving up and down, is the likelihood of having a rat. And what we're seeing is that the older buildings are much more likely to be uh, infested with rats. Perhaps makes sense because they're uh, older structures, more vulnerable to, to rats getting in, whereas newer buildings appear to be uh, less rat friendly. Um, apparently, if you live in a building built about 1950, on average, you have the lowest opportunity of rats. But again, this is sort of an average of the whole model, so it may not hold true to your specific building. The amount of green space, that is, you know, parks and trees and, and grass that we can see uh, is quite important, but in an interest, you can see this sort of hump shape where at very low amounts of green space and very high amounts of green space, we're less likely to find a rat, more so 
in those areas uh, with a medium amount of green space, say a neighborhood with a lot of uh, community gardens or an area right on the edge of the park where you have both green space in the park and anthropogenic resources in the trash and buildings next door. Those are the sweet spot areas where we tend to see more rats. And lastly, median income uh, is quite important. And the story here is that areas with lower income are more vulnerable to rats. Uh, and that's something we might expect, but it's uh, really important to note that, that we're seeing it here in the data and across the several cities I've looked at, this is a pattern that's shown up over and over again, uh, where places that are, uh, have lower income, less fortunate economic circumstances tend to have higher rat infestation. And so what can we do with this information? Well, first, it's important to note that rats do appear to respond to all three types of variation, social, natural, and the built environment. But I'm hoping that these sorts of studies can provide a template for places like the Department of Health in New York, which do have limited budgets, limited man hours to, to give. Uh, and so we can help to prioritize the areas that uh, really need the most attention. So for instance, older buildings in lower income areas, right? You likely have the most impact if you can focus in areas like that. Or perhaps the parks or green spaces that are um, in that sweet spot adjacent to, to humans and food resources. And so in this way, we can take our, our model um, and sort of get out of the academic bubble and try and bring it to the people that actually work on rats to have a conversation about what we're seeing in terms of the ecological drivers of rat abundance. Now, I wanna move on and talk a little bit about population connectivity of rats. Here, we're talking about the, you can think about the, the family relatedness and the networks of, um, of related rats across a whole city. So what we did first, sort of walk you through this workflow, is we went out and trapped rats all across Manhattan. This was basically two years of my grad school experience walking the streets, looking for rats and trapping them. We would take a piece of the tail tissue back to the lab and extract the DNA. So we have sort of a, a representation of that rat's life in the DNA there. And then instead of sequencing every little bit of the genome, which is still quite expensive, what we did is we chopped up the genome into little fragments, right? Into little bite-sized bits. And so for each individual rat, we put a little identifier on that genetic material and we then sequenced those, those bits. And down at number four here, you can see what that might look like. We can identify the single nucleotide polymorphisms, the little mutations in the genetic code that allow us to tell rats apart. So in this instance, Rat number one and rat number three appear more related to each other than they are to rat two because they have, oops, sorry, an A, whereas rat number two has a T in that specific location. So we can do this over many thousands of locations to get really in-depth and high resolution uh, information about the relatedness of rats. So what did we find? Now, I'm going to walk you guys through th this plot. Essentially, what we're looking at is the connections and relatedness between any two rats at different distances within the city. So moving left to right, we have rats that are closer together on the left and further apart on the right. Uh, any pair of rats that we were thinking about. And on the y-axis, moving up and down, is the you can think about it as the relatedness of rats to one another. So at very short distances within 200 meters of one another, we see really elevated levels of relatedness, which makes sense. These are uh, probably rat colonies or groups of closely related families that occupy the same space. Then moving away from one another, within 200 to 1600 meters, we see something really interesting. We see that rats are less related but they're still uh, more related than they would be at random, which is that zero line, sort of no relatedness. We're seeing this, this even decrease in rat relatedness. You could think, it, think of it as the you know, first and second and third cousin that live on the next block over and the next block from that. And these sort of little rat neighborhoods that appear to be popping up within the city. Past 1600 meters, we can think about rats as unrelated on average, no more related than any two random individuals we could pick out of a pool. And if this seems a little abstract, 
um, hard to visualize. We can think about it in the context of a city. Uh, we can think about two rat colonies here represented with these, these blue rats. And those first 200 meters are really representing the home range of those, those rats and the, the, the areas where they tend to visit on a daily basis and to, um, to share space with their, their close relatives. So basically within a full city block or maybe across uh, one or two city blocks, you tend to have really closely related rats that aren't limited to just a single household, but actually live within that 200 meter area. So your neighbor's rats really treat your backyard and their backyard as the same space. In that 200 to 400 to 1600 window, this is where rats from different colonies start to interbreed and mix those genes up with one another. Um, but we can still see evidence of how they're related back to those central locations. And then past that again, these rats become too mixed to really tell apart uh, and are at that stage where we call them unrelated. So you can imagine many colonies like this dotted all over the landscape, um, sharing relatives with one another when they're close together. Now I wanna zoom out a little bit and talk about the patterns that we found across the whole city. So each one of these red dots is a rat that we trapped um, and took a DNA sample from. I've broken them up into the different uh, community districts of Manhattan. Um, so we see the downtown further south and midtown as we move up, uptown, Harlem, and then upper Manhattan up top. And if you keep those colors in mind of the the, uh, the neighborhood background there. I can show you here what we found, sort of a summary of the overall genetic variation. And so here, each of those dots on the plot is a single rat. And what we've done is we've tried to identify the major trends in variation, right? We've got hundreds of rats with thousands of nucleotide differences, and we're summarizing them just over these two axes. And so from from uh, top to bottom here on the y-axis, we can see that uh, we can summarize almost a quarter of the overall variation, which is quite a lot, just based on this north to south gradient. You can see the rats on the bottom tend to be from the, the southern neighborhoods, the rats on the top from the northern neighborhoods. And we can see a pretty even uh, spectrum of genetic variation moving from north to south. Moving left to right, we can see there's also some difference on the east-west side. In this instance, we're seeing a split between the West Village rats and the East Village rats. Um, and each, each uh, human neighborhood tends to have uh, rats that sort of represent that neighborhood genetically and are more related to themselves. And the boundaries are not exactly the same as, as our community districts, but they tend to match fairly closely. Now, when we looked a little bit closer at this, we noticed it's not simply that there's a north to south gradient. That's not the only thing going on here. Instead, we can see some, some differences in the genetic diversity. And so on the right here, what I'm showing you is a plot of the inbreeding coefficient. So the brighter green, higher numbers are basically more inbred rats. You can think about them as uh, their parents being more related, so they have lower genetic diversity in the brighter green and higher genetic diversity in the darker blue where parents are more related, those genes get more mixed up. And there's a pretty striking pattern here where the area in Midtown shows lower diversity. And we think that's likely due to few, simply fewer rats that don't travel as far to mate so they tend to be more similar to one another um, and less diverse. Uh, and the diverse neighborhoods would be places like uh, Inwood up top in the north or the Upper West Side, Upper East Side and, and further south. So this, this pattern around Midtown was quite striking and we wanted to, to look a little bit closer about what was going on there. So we, we tried one more program analysis here. Let me show you. So this analysis, we asked it, what are the major population groups uh, that are kind of more related to themselves uh, than anybody else in the city? And we kept seeing over and over this divide of uptown rats, 
uh, which are these black squares, and the downtown rats being the white squares. Essentially, the different colors are the different subpopulations, and the size of those, uh, those squares represent the magnitude of difference. And so we can see the split here is right across that midtown area. You might notice this one white dot up in Central Park, um, which showed up over and over again. It must have been uh, a long distance migrant. Maybe it hitched a ride on a trash truck or somebody went and released it up there, but it's one that is basically a long way from home. Uh, its home is maybe down in the East Village, but somehow it ended up in, in Central Park, right? But when we published this result about what we were calling uptown and downtown rats, uh, the media really took off with it. <laughs> It was a fun day of, of seeing all the memes and stories that popped up about, uh, you know, Uptown Girl is now Uptown Rat and things like that. And so watching, uh, watching Lewis Black talk about my study on, on The Daily Show was, was quite a memory. Um, and people in New York, I think, tend to love learning about the rats, whether they're disgusted or curious, they wanna know more about them. And so revealing this sort of hidden divide between rats in Manhattan was, uh, I think really touched a nerve. <laughs> Um, my favorite thing that, that happened though, of course, was Ripley's Believe It or Not, which is something that as a little kid who was into weird animals was one of my favorite things to look at. They, seeing my name written about uh, by Ripley's Believe It or Not was a little dream come true. And you can see these sort of caricatures that represent the uptown and downtown rats. In reality, there's no physical difference. There's no obvious behavioral difference between these rats. They're simply uh, different genetic families that don't tend to mix. And we can think about why that is. Why is Midtown acting as this barrier to movement for rats in Manhattan? And we can think a little bit about the type of environment that, that Midtown Manhattan represents, right? It's quite different from the rest of the city. I'm sure anyone who lives here in New York knows uh, Midtown tends to be dominated by uh, tourists and commercial interests, uh, big transit hubs. Of course, things are a little bit different now with COVID, but generally these are areas that don't actually have as many people that live in those spaces. It's more of a, a transient uh, population. So one thing that we think is going on is that there's simply less food for the rats uh, because there's less household garbage and the garbage that is there tends to be picked up more quickly. There's it really uh, tends to be higher levels of sanitation in these sort of high profile areas. The other bit, which you can see here in this uh, Google Earth image, is in the northern and southern parts of, of, the, of the city where, where people tend to live, city blocks are sort of shaped like a donut, right? There's houses on the outside and on the interior are backyards and gardens and alleyways um, and other places that rats can create burrows and hide out and create um, colonies within a city block. Whereas in Midtown Manhattan, uh, buildings tend to take up nearly the entire block. There's no backyards, there are fewer alleyways and things like that. So there are simply fewer opportunities for rats to be successful. And that isn't to say that there aren't rats in Midtown, there certainly are, but they tend to be at lower densities than the surrounding areas. Um, and because of that, it's harder for rats to pass their genetic information through Midtown as uh, rats sort of jump from block to block over generations. Uh, there's less movement across that Midtown area and more movement within the downtown rats and within the uptown rats, which makes them sort of show up genetically as distinct from one another. And this is something, this, this divide within a city is something we also identified in other cities like New Orleans and, and Vancouver, Canada. Um, I don't have time to go into e the results from each of those cities, but I just wanna mention that we did notice uh, unique subpopulations of rats in each city that we looked at that were divided by these different ecological conditions. So the takeaways for folks interested in creating some actionable um, uh, results from this. When we think about rat neighborhoods, we want to think about their, their true size in the context of the rats. So up to a kilometer and a half, almost a mile out, you have rats that are related to one another, which means we're really not doing that much if we're just treating rats at a single property level. 
we really need to be treating them across whole neighborhoods. Uh, and that's something that New York City has started to do. Uh, they're sort of finally turning the corner here to, to, to think in this more ecological way. Uh, we've identified that there's variation within the city that can create different uh, population structure of rats. Again, this midtown creating divisions between uptown and downtown rats. Uh, and lastly, that there are these clear movement barriers uh, in, in cities that we can use to our advantage. And what I mean by that is if we can treat the, the independent populations of rats separately, uh, we're more likely to have success because if we use those, those natural migration barriers to our advantage as the edges of our management units, we're less likely to have rats hopping over from the northern side to the southern side and vice versa. And of course, it may be difficult to treat the whole downtown area and the whole uptown area, but this is the sort of, uh, sort of thought process that we can use, um, especially when looking at, at smaller scales in other cities to basically take the biology of the rats that we can observe um, and use it to create the most effective management strategies. So the last bit of research I want to talk to you about is something new. Um, this is work that's just uh, been published online recently. And what we're looking at is how rats have adapted to cities. On the left, what you're seeing is uh, a uh, grassland area from northern China, which is the home range of rats, right? This is where Rattus norvegicus originally came from. It was a wild environment. There were grasses, there were grains for, for them to eat, um, of course, other animals for them to interact with. And on the right, we're seeing a typical alleyway where rats tend to live now. So we know the environment changed quite a bit as rats spread across the world. And what we don't know is how they've actually adapted with uh, new traits or new behaviors to uh, fit in with and, and be successful in these areas because we know rats are clearly successful and, and have experienced a lot of pressures from the city. So we wanna know how has that changed them at the genomic level. Uh, this work was led by Arbel Har Harpak up there on the, the top right, who's uh, uh, really, created some ingenious ways to identify evolutionary signals of adaptations. And so what we've done is compared rats in New York City to rats in Northern China in that home range to look for clear differences in the genetic makeup. And so each of these, uh, these dots popping up with the, with the labels over here on the left um, represent genes of interest that appear to have undergone a, a selection process uh, which means that the environment is changing them in some way. Um, and so now we can go and look at what those genes are and try and ask, what does this tell us about rat biology? And so we've noticed a few things to, to simplify. Um, for one, there are adaptations in the locomotive development of rats, which may, uh, the muscular and skeletal system, which may have been tested by the complexity of, of urban environments that they've have to traverse. We found that their diets likely drive changes in uh, their metabolic processes. So they've adapted to higher fat diets, higher protein diets, which makes sense because we eat lots of fat and protein and rats eat whatever we eat. And the last thing is that we found that there seem to be adaptations in the way they metabolize uh, exogenous compounds, uh, things they pick up in the environment that their body wants to process. Uh, and one of those things, of course, is the poisons that we use against rats. Um, and this is the story I want to focus on a little bit and talk a little bit first about the history of rodenticide use uh, and the biology of, of, of what's been going on in this war between uh, the rats and the humans. As humans, we have tools that we've created and invented like rat poison. On the rat side, all they can do is evolve and change in response. So in, 19, in the 1940s, uh, warfarin uh, was developed as an anticoagulant rodenticide. Uh, that same compound is used in uh, human medicines. Uh, it's, it's a blood thinner, right? It's an anticoagulant that keeps the rats from uh, developing clots and eventually leads to their death. 
right? And this takes place quite quickly with the original warfarin compound. So a rat would die within about 24 hours of eating that, that poison. Quite quickly, uh, in Europe especially, and in the United States, uh, widespread resistance to this poison was noted. And this, we found, was due to a single mutation, a single uh, base pair change in the rat was enough to inactivate the effect of this poison. And so when the poison doesn't work, the rats reproduce, uh, and we have resistant rats that are winning this war. Of course, humans are smart. We come up with, with new ways to... Uh, to, to fight rats. And so what we've done is created second generation rodenticides. These are, uh, seem to be much more effective against rats. And one way is that they take much longer uh, to work. They spend more time in the rat body and, and basically have them die at a slower rate over maybe three or four days as opposed to one day. And what that means is that rats consume lots of this bait over several days, they're out in the environment and they start to get sluggish. They start to get lethargic as the rodenticide takes effect. Uh, and that makes them easy prey for predators that pick them off. Um, so in New York, that might be red-tailed hawks or herons and, and such, uh, perhaps foxes in areas like Staten Island or the Bronx. And so when, when the pre predators eat their prey, eat these rats that have have the rodenticide within their system, they in turn become poison and often succumb. And so it's this really terrible process of secondary poisoning where we're trying to kill the rats, but we end up harming a lot of the other wildlife that we'd really rather keep around. So what's going on with the rat adaptations to this? What we've found is that rats do appear to be somewhat resistant to this second generation uh, anticoagulants. Um, but it's, it's complex. It's not simply that single mutation that I just talked about. Uh, there, there's something else going on. And what our results showed was that there's clear adaptations to several uh, liver enzymes, which would be used to essentially clean out the body uh, and, and detoxify uh, these, these anticoagulants. So rather than just inactivating they're actually working to pass those poisons through them at a rapid rate and are able to perhaps survive in that way. Um, and this is something that has been studied before. Uh, these liver metabol metabolites or um, enzymes have been sort of pointed at by other studies, but this is the first to show in a wild population that yes, there does appear to be some adaptive processes going on um, with these genes likely in response to the rodenticides that are used. And the thing about rodenticides is they're everywhere. You look around, you see those black bait boxes on the, on the sides of buildings and things. It's really the number one tool that pest managers tend to use to get rid of rats. And because they're so widespread, um, we do see lots of damage to, to the environment through the secondary poisoning process. And that happens in New York. Many of you are probably aware of the hawks that have died from, from rat poison. Uh, Laura Goggin has done a great job of documenting some of these, um, including uh, this individual uh, in, in Columbus Park downtown who slowly died one afternoon, was later found to be due to rat poison. You can see the mate looking on. So just some really tragic stories about individual animals that, that we care about, but we know at a population level, this can have um, a, a real drastic effect, not just on the common animals like, like hawks, but some of the recovering bird species um, or new inhabitants like coyotes in our cities uh, that may, may eat rats. Um, and not to be too much doom and gloom, but just to, to sort of drive home the point that this is a problem. Um, you know, 84% of the raptors that are found and sent to the DEC in New York test positive for these anticoagulant rodenticides, the ARs. Um, and it's owls, it's falcons, it's hawks, it's herons, like this unfortunate black crowned night heron. And it's not just the birds of prey. I mean, we, we do see it when, when we look at things like, like squirrels even sometimes to come because they eat the poison instead. We found evidence of rodenticides in insects even. So we know that these 
rodenticides don't just go where we want them to go in terms of killing the rats, they spread throughout our environments. And so that brings up uh, a question of how we can change this. You know, what, what are the other strategies out there? And, and why isn't this working, right? So one thing to think about is that when we're just throwing rat poison out there to kill the rats, we're not doing a lot to change the environment and it allows rats to rebound quite quickly. So I think it's exemplified by this photo. You can see a classic bait box here in the foreground, which might do some damage to the rats, but in the background, you can see some trash, right? So there's breakfast, lunch, and dinner for any rats that survive and can then go on to let that population rebound. So it's just sort of showing in a single photo the problem with reliance on rodenticides. Instead, uh, I preach, and not just myself, this is becoming you know, more and more accepted as sort of the best way to, to do this using an integrated pest management strategy, meaning we're integrating lots of different tools and strategies that are really aimed at modifying the environment and lowering the overall carrying capacity, so the total number of rats that are able to live in that environment. And there's a couple ways that that works. What can we do to, to incorporate IPM into our, uh, our work? In New York City, I think the most obvious and clearest thing we need to do is get a handle on our trash, right? Anyone who lives here has seen these piles of trash bags on the street. That is the regulated way to discard trash in New York City, but it's clearly a buffet for the rats. Um, and we've just started to implement some policy about managing the way these bags can be put out at what times and, and such. But in reality, we need a, a real sea change in the way that we deal with, with trash. And it's difficult in New York, right? There's barely enough room for all of us to live here. What do we do with the trash? We're not gonna create you know, these massive structures that are, that are compounds to keep our, our trash safe, but we do need to change our strategy. On the bottom, you can see one one way that strategy has been enacted and perhaps uh, failed, you see these big belly trash cans on the street on the right side. These are rat proof trash cans, which are great. They, rats really can't get into them. But right next to it, you see the old classic trash bag. Um, and so when you create, you know, you use this expensive um, and, and functional rat proof trash can, but you put it right next to a vulnerable trash can, you're really not changing very much. So this sort of speaks to the lack of communication between these programs in New York City, um, but sort of some, some strategies, but plenty of room, room to change. The second thing that IPM uh, really preaches is the change in habitat. So modifying the habitat to be less uh, less supportive of rats. Um, one of the things is to think about the, the plantings that you use. This really uh, sort of cartoonish description says that you would rather use V-shaped plants that are narrow at the base and wide at the top than an A-shaped -shape, plant that is wide at the base because those A-shaped plants are able to uh, create cover for the rats to hide underneath. So things like ivy or low-level bushes allow rats to hide right in, in, um, in the middle of a, of a planting, whereas they're less comfortable when there's open spaces um, and you're, you're more likely to see them. Um, when it comes to our buildings, we need to really uh, batten down each building we're trying to protect, including uh, the underground infrastructure that connects it uh, to the rest of the city. Um, this is you know, easy to say, but when you think about the work that requires uh, at a neighborhood or even a city level, it's expensive, it's laborious, um, and it requires some difficult decisions. You know, when you're the, the best way to, to get rid of rats in a garden is to you know pave over the garden, and there's no more plants for the rats to use. But who wants to pave over their gardens, right? And and that's not something that that I support. I think there is an intelligent way to do this that finds sort of a balance between um, you know, the aesthetics of our spaces and the way we want to use them and their ability to support rats. There should be a, a balance there in how we, we build and maintain our cities. Third is using new tools, right? We don't just have to use rodenticides. We can use other things to kill rats. Um, one of the things that's recently been, been implemented is dry ice. 
This is uh, solid frozen carbon dioxide for those who don't know. You put it in a rat burrow, it sublimates into CO2. You close up that rat burrow and basically the animal suffocates down there, but it, it dies painlessly and stays in place rather than, than going out into the environment. Um, there are other strategies like reproductive control where you feed rats these liquid baits on the bottom that actually uh, essentially sterilize them um, reproductively so they can't produce babies. And that way you're not just killing them and leaving a hole for new rats to show up. You're actually um, sort of slowly bringing that population down. Unfortunately, in cities where I've just talked about uh, these sort of open populations with rats moving between blocks where their cousins live and, and their second cousins. It's very difficult to do this in a way that keeps all the rats sterile. So if you're not treating all the rats, this really isn't going to work. Um, and then there are new techniques out there uh, that aren't in use yet, but there's uh, you know potential for genetic engineering, um, which of course brings up lots of moral and political issues with it. Um, but there are people out there trying to create uh, basically rats that would only produce male rats, thus um, sort of limiting the reproductive uh, the strategy um, of those rats overall. So new tools. Fourth is uh, the way we regulate these things, right? The way we allow people to use them. Um, in New York, it's really easy to hire someone who comes and they're going to use rodenticide as their first option. Um, other places like California, known to be you know, progressive on issues like this, is working to, uh, to change the laws, to tighten down regulations on rodenticides, even to ban them outright. Now, I think a full ban on rodenticides probably is not wise. Uh, again, you know, while this is a potentially harmful tool to mountain lions and bobcats and such, it is a really effective tool when there's a public health crisis at work and you need a fast way to remove rats and keep people safe. Um, so I think more of a, a regulatory approach as opposed to a ban is, is smart, um, but there are those debates going on right now. And then last is that we need to think about the amount of work that goes into really reducing rat numbers. It's not as simple as showing up doing one treatment and walking away. Um, if you really want to take care of rats, you have to spend a lot of time, uh, money, and um, effort to make sure these rats uh, stay at bay. So not just the ones you can see, but the ones perhaps you know hiding in the sewer grate waiting for the rats in your backyard to go away so they have a chance. Um, it requires a lot of work um, and a lot of time. And so to do this at a citywide level, again, um, is quite difficult. So I'm talking about sort of the ideal here in um, the best way to do this if, if money is not an option. But of course, uh, every city and every manager needs to sort of make the, the decisions where they can, how they can incorporate these IPM approaches uh, while also doing something that's feasible. So what have we learned here today? Well, I hope I've convinced you that rats are really fascinating. They're not just gross little uh, scurriers, but they've, they've actually got quite a lot of uh, interesting behaviors and traits, um, but they are a real risk to, to people in cities when it comes to public health and infrastructure. Uh, we talked about how rat abundance in New York is associated with the age of buildings and the type of income and green space in those areas. Uh, I taught you a bit about the uptown and downtown split in Manhattan and how we have different subpopulations divided by Midtown as a sort of movement barrier. And we've talked about how rats have been shown to evolve uh, to the, the pressures of a city and to the types of rodenticides we use to control them. So there's really a sort of a dynamic relationship going on here. And last, just to, to drive home the point that it's easy to identify these rat issues, but really creating um, effective strategies that are good for the environment uh, is quite difficult, but I do think it's possible. Um, and I think that as a city, we're slowly inching our way there. There's certainly uh, room to grow in that respect. Um, but I like to think that uh, our policies are becoming uh, more environmentally conscious, more ecologically minded. That said, there's still a lot of rats out there and a lot of work to do to go. Um, so, Thank you for your time and for your attention. 
I'm happy to take questions. I want to just say thank you uh, to everyone at Linnaean Society for inviting me um, and looking forward to talking more. If you have questions about anything particular we don't get to, feel free to contact me. My email there is down at the bottom. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, Matt, thank you for an awesome talk. I think um, there's a bunch of questions rolling in, but I think we all want to know are there any human studies um, about that liver enzyme? Because after COVID, all the humans are going to need something that um, mitigates the amount of toxins that have passed through their livers during the, the pandemic. No, I'm just kidding. But, yeah. <laughs> well, we do have the same suite of genes that I'm talking about, and I'm sure they're active. Okay, well, that's probably, that's probably where you're going to make your first million right there. <laughs> Um, I'm going to try to combine a few questions um, so we can get through more of them. Uh, first, someone's asking, um, are there also black rats as well as brown rats in NYC? And can you say something about their history in NYC, their comparative behavior and ecology, interactions between the two species, and how to tell them apart physically? And then someone else wanted to know what's the ratio of brown to black. So maybe you can cover that too. It's a yeah. lot of pieces. Yeah. So to start, at the moment, there are no black rats in New York City. At least there's no, there's no populations that are, are surviving. Um, there may be an individual that shows up on a boat or something, but for the most part, our city does not support black rats. It's only brown rats. Black rats tend to be uh, further south uh, and on the west coast and southwest, um, at least in the United States. Um, they don't do quite as well in the colder conditions uh, that, that we have here, they, they don't, aren't really able to survive the winters as well. Now, the way you can tell them apart, which sort of relates to, to their inability to survive winters, is the size, right? So, uh, well, a couple things. Black rats are a little bit smaller. Um, they have darker fur, but that does tend, tend to change. The most easiest way to tell them apart is that for a black rat, the tail is longer than the size of the body. If you measure from the snout to the start of the tail, it's gonna be shorter than from the base to the tip of the tail. Whereas for brown rats, the tail is always shorter than the size of the body. So that's a, that's a quick way to tell. Um, the ears are a little bit bigger on, on black rats um, and, and the head is a little bit smaller, but here in New York, you're not gonna to have to tell them apart. Um, in some places uh, like England, for example, there have been, uh, uh, the history is essentially that first there were black rats, which invaded earlier into Europe, and many of those were displaced by the larger brown rat, which um, tends to uh, win in a fight. If they're battling over the same resources, the, the brown rat will outcompete the black rat. So that happened within the cities of, of Paris and London. Um, let's see, in New York City, we know that rats showed up in the, the late 1700s. Um, so really early on in the history of our city, uh, you know, when we were just sort of established in the downtown area and the rest was, was farmland and forest, rats showed up on, on those, those early ships. And we know that they came from coloni colonists from Europe, mostly England and France. We've done some genetic studies uh, to show the global relatedness of rats. And we can see that the ones in New York stem from those populations in England and France. And so they sh showed up early, late eight, 18th century and have persisted through then. They have grown in population as the city has grown. Um, of course, there's a lot we don't know um, about the, you know, the ins and outs of the history at that time, but we do have records of, of established rats. Um, if you want a little bit of a, uh, something to go Google, you can go look at John James Audubon's uh, uh, drawings of rats that he uh, made down in Battery Park looking at rats. So you can even go down there and probably see some rats yourself, but he has some, some illustrations of rats here from New York City, actually. Oh, um, maybe we should have a talk about Audubon and rats sometime. But um, two questions that are unrelated, but very interesting. One is, are brown rats territorial? And then can they survive on a vegan diet? <laughs> um, are they territorial? The answer is usually yes. Um, in mostly I'm talking about the male rats. 
generally the social structure of a colony is that there are a few adult male rats that are the dominant rats. They're usually the biggest and the oldest. Uh, and they want control of the food resources in their area and the mates in their area. So there's usually a larger number of females, smaller number of males. And as the young babies grow up, right, there may be uh, male juvenile rats that are left alone for the first month or two of their life. But once they reach maturity, those older rats will start to see them as competitors and chase them out. And so you might hear rats fighting at night. Sometimes that's these sort of territorial disputes going on uh, as the, the old male rats push out the young male rats. And there's a caveat there, as there always is in ecology, which is that if there's enough food and enough resources to go around, the level of competition tends to decrease. So it's only when they start to fight over those, those food resources uh, that you see the more aggressive, aggressive rats come out. Um, let's see, the second question was about vegan diets. Let's see, they would be able to survive for, um, for quite a while, uh, but as, and as long as they can get the, the nutrients they need, the vitamins in particular, things like vitamin e, D and E, um, they might do all right. And we know that rats can actually be choosy about their food. It's not just that they'll eat whatever's in front of them, but they'll pick the foods that are the most nutritious. And we've seen this in, in studies of, of food choice. Um, so, you know, if they haven't had any meat or fish for a while, they might start to crave it. Um, but they are able to uh, survive off a range of nutritional conditions. Um, they might suffer in terms of their weight or, or certain functions, but um, sure, there's probably some vegan rats out there where they've, where they've been limited by what they can get to. They probably have some sort of enzymatic adaptation that you just don't know about, Matt, so. <laughs> yeah, well, that'll be the next study. <laughs> okay, this is a great question, and it's something I also want to know. I know you've moved on to more um, studying, you know, Lyme disease and some other vector-borne um, systems, but um, there's a lot of talk now about the anthropos and the effects that the COVID shutdown has had on wildlife populations and bioacoustics. And so someone's asking about rat populations in light of COVID and, and, change, and the changes to human traffic patterns. So have, we, have you observed or have any of your colleagues observed any changes to populations overall? Right, so I did get this question a lot as, as sort of the, we all shut down there for a few months um, and everyone started to ask, you know, what about the rats? Um, and the, the short of it is that it really is a situationally dependent consequence. So rats that were reliant on uh, places like restaurants for food um, or office building trash, those rats started to decline in number um, as they were um, limited by food. Um, and there are stories about rats becoming uh, more, you know, quote unquote, aggressive. That's the word the CDC used in their search for food. Um, and it wasn't that they uh, sort of adapted or, or changed biologically, you know, at their root in any way. Um, their assembly behavior changed uh, as they became more food starved. So there were some uh, increased levels of, of fighting or perhaps uh, searching for food in rats that were limited. In other places, uh, like rats that live, you know, in the backyards of, of residential buildings, those rats probably did quite well because all of a sudden, everyone's home, kids are home, you're eating three meals a day. There's a lot more trash in those areas all of a sudden. So those rats probably did quite well. Um, the other bit is that people were home to notice their rats. So it's kind of hard to, to judge it based on just the stories you hear, um, because as people start to observe their own neighborhoods uh, more than they used to, they start to, to notice things like rats that where they might have just glossed right over. Um, in terms of the anthropause uh, and thinking about road traffic and things like that, it's a, quite an interesting one, which I'm hoping we can study at some point, because we did identify certain roads in cities that act as migration barriers. Rats are not good at crossing really busy roads, whether it's because they are behaviorally avoid them or because they die on their way between. Um, roads tend to be a migration barrier. 
Um, and so when there's lower traffic, we think maybe there's an opportunity there for more, uh, you know, could call it cross-pollination between the, the rat colonies on either side of the road. Um, of course, those things take a while to show up in the genetics. It doesn't happen overnight that, that the genetics change. It takes uh, sort of several generations. So it's unclear whether the pause was, was long enough for that to really have an effect on the genetic outcomes for rats. Um, but it's something I'd love to look into. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping there are others out there who, who have done it. So back to mitigation strategies uh, or removal. Uh, there's quite a few people who are asking what you think or if you have any insight into the um, rat terrier hunting groups that go out. Yes, uh, I'm quite familiar with them. Um, some of the samples that were in this study were caught by some of those terriers. Um, when it comes to being an effective strategy for, for removal of rats in cities, uh, they generally don't make a dent. Um, I can tell you that the the group that goes out with their terriers, they basically go to the same spot every week because there's always more rats, right? So they take out a few here, a few there, even a couple dozen in a night, um, but it's never enough to, to change the population as a whole. Um, where, this, where it becomes a little more effective is in the agricultural industry. Um, you know, this is what terriers are bred for, right? Going, going to farms and um, catching the rats as, as they're dug up. So if you can, you know, places like wineries or, or horse farms and places um, that have sort of an isolated problem in those areas, the dogs might be uh, quite effective. Um, and for those who are sort of queasy at, at the idea, um, it's, it's intense to think about, but it's actually a much quicker uh, death than, than a death by rodenticides, which I mentioned is long protracted process of sort of takes three or four days. Um, it's much faster with the dogs. Um, there are so many good questions and maybe we should only take one or two more. I, I think everyone should bombard you with questions, fill your inbox um, right. because there's so many good ones, but I'm gonna combine um, one of my own with this, this the one that came in about how far a single rat travels over a given period of time? Is there any data on that? And do individual rats stay within any certain limits? In my question, I was thinking about when I saw you mentioning, you know, the urban versus the rural routes for the rat, it, what dispersal patterns in general, like do they shift as, it doesn't seem like um, rats disperse very far in the urban environment, but if you, even if you move to a suburban environment, do, is dispersal, does it change? Yeah. So as a general trend, animals, including rats in cities, tend to not move as far as rats in suburban or rural areas. We've seen that over and over in, in movement studies. Um, and it sort of makes sense because new opportunities are much closer together in, and much more densely packed in, in cities. Um, and the thing about rats is they're creatures of necessity. For the most part, they're not just gonna go on a jaunt if you know, the mood strikes, they're really looking just for the next safe place to create a burrow or find a meal, right? If they're chased out by those older males I mentioned, they're only gonna go as far as they need to go to feel safe again. So most rats really don't travel more uh, than a few hundred meters in a lifetime. Um, we do have evidence of individual pairs of rats. So, um, you know, a mother and offspring or two siblings traveling up to 600 meters apart from one another, just in, in sort of cold hard evidence. Um, and, but that said, when we think about rat movement patterns, you know, I, I think I presented it here and in other places as you could think about like a circle around a rat movement. But rats don't necessarily travel in a, in a nice neat circles. They're really going um, just between their burrow and the places where they can find food or find other rats. And so their, their movement patterns might be sort of odd and sinusoidal and, and sort of different directions to get where they need to go. And they might travel back and forth on these weird routes quite frequently if, you know, once they're established, um, you might see a, you know, a rat zooming down a block, f trying to figure out where it goes. Usually that rat knows where it's going because the same food is there every night. So. I hope that wasn't a rat. <laughs> Big rat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, no, so in cities, it, it tends to be just a few hundred meters, but it really is, is unique in each situation. So, you know, what I'm presenting here are kind of population averages, um, but it, it really depends on, on your particular neighborhood and your area. But you can think for the most part, rats don't want to move very far, but they're, they're capable if they have to. Um, and that's kind of the cool thing about rats is they're strong enough uh, they're, they're, they have enough energy that if they need to travel several miles, they can. And in fact, the experiments have been done. We, we don't do this anymore, but in New Orleans, 1915, there was a guy who basically took a bunch of rats, collected them all, put numbers on them, and released them in part of a city and waited a few days to see where he could find them. And he found some, you know, up to four miles away just a few days later. So we know they're capable of moving really far distances usually when they're in unfamiliar circumstances. So if you let a, you catch a rat and you think you're helping it out by you know, putting it a few blocks away, when it shows up in this new, new environment that it doesn't know, it's gonna just take off and start, start traveling much further distances than it would normally. Okay, I'm gonna end on uh, a question that um, we're all, once COVID is over, I think we're all gonna go back to, especially in the Northeast, Lyme disease being our number one concern. And so someone is asking, how are rats connected to Lyme disease? And I know you're uniquely situated to answer this question because some of your colleagues and your lab are studying rodents as, you know, as part of this vector and you know, picking ticks off of them. So are people doing this with rats? That's right. That's right. Um, so I do, yeah, I study Lyme disease dynamics now, as well as rats. Um, and the short answer is that rats can carry Lyme disease. Uh, they do pick up ticks um, and they do contract, they, they are uh, what we call competent reservoirs. So their, their bodies are able to be re reservoirs for this bacteria for a tick then to, to bite that rat and pick up the bacteria. That said, they're not quite as common of a host as just your average uh, white-footed mouse or vole or raccoon or something like that. And part of that is that rats groom themselves and they groom each other in the colony. So that social aspect of rats where you know, white-footed mice are more solitary creatures and they'll self-groom, but they won't groom one another, which means that the ticks are often found on their faces and their ears where they can't groom themselves for rats, their, you know, their colony mate could pick those off for them. Um, and I can tell you I've dissected rat guts before and I've found not ticks but other ectoparasites in there. So we do know that they do eat these creatures when, when they find them on each other. Um, so short answer is yes, rats can carry Lyme disease, but they're really not the most important vector. Um, and in Manhattan, there's uh, no like sort of local reservoirs of Lyme that we found. Um, in the city, it tends to be more um, in, in the larger, more connected areas like the Bronx or Staten Island, where we see a lot more. I guess that's good news. And yeah. I'm going to end it there. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, thanks so much for a fantastic talk. I want to thank everyone for really good questions. I wish we had time to get to all of them. You know, Matt's been generous enough to provide his contact information, which I thought was a little dangerous, but <laughs> we'll see what happens. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Ken so he can close out the meeting. So thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Well, given our current news stories and with telling irony, uh, the subject of rats uh, seems quite apt for today and for t this evening's presentation. Matt, thank you so much for that excellent and informative uh, talk. You've certainly given me a better understanding of my neighborhood and those I share my block with. Um, I, uh, I thank you uh, again, and I look forward to um, more, hearing more about your research, in particular with Lyme's disease. So good luck with all of that. Um, I hope that everyone who had the opportunity to be with us tonight will return for next month's program when we will present Don Krudsma and Birdsong for the Curious Naturalist. Until then, good birding everyone. Uh, stay healthy, stay active, stay positive, and have a good night. Good night.